seminar of, for 2GB in sustainable system and complex envelope. Our guest lecturer, Roberto Davoglio, will be uh, conducting a, a workshop together with me this uh, week, but we thought that this introductory lecture could be of interest of, for uh, several other students, and therefore we thought to open it to the, to the old school session. So I'm very pleased to see that other students have come, and I hope you will find the topic interesting. I would like to thank Marcelo Spina for helping organizing this special workshop connected to the seminar. I think we, it's an it's a interesting um, opportunity for, for the students and at large for the school to combine several uh, very contemporary topic uh, in, in a seminar format. Um, tonight's introduction uh, lecture will uh, show, uh, Roberto will show us some of his uh, more recent work and a little bit of the history of his work and uh, to me what is, uh, in, in my introduction actually, as a, as a friend and a colleague of Roberto for the past six years, I like just to, to say an anecdote, I think, connected to this and uh, to treat this as a kind of a friendly introduction to say that uh, Roberto is sort of a Marco Polo contemporary uh, history. Uh, he started studying in, the, in Venice in Italy architecture and then he moved to the Bartlett in uh, London to then complete his stu studies at uh, Columbia for, with a master, studying uh, with uh, Greg Lean. And then he moved to Los Angeles where he worked with uh, Neil Denari and then uh, with a consulting company called ASI, Advanced Structure, where he started developing his interest in complex envelope and materiality and uh, computation. And uh, then he moved to Asia where he started working with Foster and finally he opened his own office in Hong Kong where he's actually currently based. So he's just visiting Los Angeles for this special workshop and uh, I'm very pleased to welcome him here. Thank you. Good evening. Um, I also would like to thank Ilari and Marcello for giving me the opportunity to come here and present my work. Um, I apologize if I'm mumbling a little bit. It's just the jet lag is literally killing me right now. So I hope in a little adrenaline rush, I hope the adrenaline rush will help me out a little bit. Um, <clears throat> Um, I don't have a lot of time, so um, I would like to show you uh, quite a few things. So we'll go very, very quick. A lot of images, not a lot of talk, and hopefully you will not be too bored. Um, I would like to start with two projects that defined my um, interest in architecture as well as my career path. I sort of call myself as a structural specialist because uh, I like to work on the kind of projects that require a lot of attention to details and relationship between building components in 3D. So I've been very fortunate working on a number of projects where the architectural complexity allowed me to experiment and play with the, uh, not only the most advanced digital techniques, techniques which I will show you at the end of the, of the presentation, but also uh, I had the fortune to work with very interesting architects and designers. So. I would like to start very quickly with two projects. They are, to me, sitting at the extremes of contemporary architectural thinking. Um, one is the Eric Cohen Moss glass canopy, which is, was, was built a few years ago. Interesting because it's a project that pushes the boundaries of design and fabrication processes to the limit. And the other one is, uh, is the currently under design, actually under, they're currently building in Beijing, China, um, the new airport designed by Norman Foster's. To me, those two buildings represent the extremes, not only in terms of um, size. Uh, one is a gigantic three kilometers long building. The other one is slightly smaller scale uh, structure, but also because they're in completely different cultures where the design development of the building is very much affected by the perception of the different people. So I will start with the project you might be familiar. Um, it's I think it's probably the most complicated glass canopy ever built. Um, m most of the technology, especially f um, the glass technology, was actually developed while designed. 
Um, at the time I was employed at this um, very interesting um, engineering and fabrication company called ASI, and with them we managed to try to engineer, fabricate, and install a very, very complex system. So I will go through very, very quickly because I have a lot of things to show you. Um, if I'm going too fast, please let me know. So you start, all the projects that I will show you will are fully developed using production quality 3D models. And um, the software used vary uh, from Maya that everybody's familiar to AutoCAD, MicroStation, CATIA, digital projects, you name it. Uh, my goal is to use the best possible tools per, depending on the different tasks. So here we are starting with a 3D Studio Max presentation of the concept of the canopy. As you can see, it is composed by 17 glass panels um, controlled by a fairly rigid grid structure. Each glass panel is quite big in size. It's about, it ranges from 10 to 12 feet by six to eight. And there is absolutely no repetition. Each panel is unique, not only in geometry, but also in relationship with each other. And um, there are a number of challenges in these projects. There were a lot of unknowns when we started. Uh, glass is a very delicate material. It's a material that requires a lot of sensitivity. Um, it's, it's one of the few materials that can only be controlled on a statistical level. It doesn't give you any real data, or at least it doesn't as, 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 as um, precisely as you would get out of steel structures. So there is a lot of trial and error. It's a very crafty process to understand the behavior of the glass. So you start by digitizing the geometry and testing the material under particular stress. So here you can see very elegant, very sexy, I think, stress analysis studies in which we see how each panel behaves under certain conditions. Um, this slide, you see my mouse? Yeah. Um, those are some of the modifications that we had to make on certain panels in order to redistribute, sort of massage the geometry in order to allow the stresses um, to be uniformly distributed on the surface instead of being um, stuck in a certain areas, especially closer to the clamp systems. A example of, can you hear me? Sorry, one second. <laughs> okay. Um, sorry, if you don't see my face, I hope you don't mind. I prefer to sit down. Um, what the panel looks like in a comfortable plan projective view on the computer and what you actually need to fabricate in order to achieve that result. Um, the, the interesting part of the process is actually uh, not only the glass but the, all the structure that it is required to generate the shape. So those are just two of the extremist uh, mold which are uh, we, which were built straight from the CNC machine, so there was not a lot of rationalization. They were built out of eighth of an inch stainless carbon steel um, um, fins, as you can see, and they were absolutely beautiful. Beautiful structure, as you can see, this is the scale of one of them, so very, very big. Each one was custom designed for a different uh, piece of uh, glass. Uh, the process is very, very basic, I mean, the, uh, you know, especially for those of you who have experience in the architectural field, the fabrication te techniques are very, very basic, very, very primitive. So as you can see here, you see Mr. Kim grinding down the unpolished edges. This is a water jet machine to custom cut all the glass, all, all the metal fins. Um, this is a little bit of inverse engineering to see if the final fabricated mold would is as close as possible to the digital reality. Complex clamp system. Um, keep in mind that when the double bend, when the geometry of the glass, double bend glass is too complex, you, you cannot take full advantage of some um, fabrication techniques such as tempering of the glass. So the only safety factor it is given by the lamination. But because we are in a seismic area, um, it, it's a project built here in Culver City, so it, it goes through quite extreme um, thermal um, environmental conditions, hot during the day, cold during the night, and also there is this uh, earthquake complicating factors. The, we come up with a system of complicated layering of neoprenes. So 
You, you use harder neoprene to clamp the glass, but then you use a softer one to allow the glass to float and dissipate all the stresses that will given by possible earthquakes. So those are some of the study mock-ups, as you can see here. Uh, it is complex because it's sort of a robot that it needs to be able to, 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 to grab the glass coming down at very different, in infinite ranges of, of angles. So the technique is not very different from an uh, average pizza maker in Italy. It's a flat piece of annealed glass that is sitting on top of the, our steel mold. The white material is a fiberglass. Uh, glass and steel don't get along very well, so you, need to, you always need an intermediate material to make them like each other a little bit more. It's a long process. It's a 12 hours uh, um, heating and cooling, and uh, it is quite challenging because uh, you need to slump two pieces of glass at the same time. So the balance between the hottest and the coolest temperature needs to be highly controlled because you don't want to have the two glasses piece getting stuck with each other, getting glued with each other at this stage at least. And also you don't want to overstress the glass panels. As I said, glass is a material that is very sensitive to temperature. So if the cooling and heating is too extreme, you would be left with some residual interior stresses in the glass that would ultimately break. Um, very low-tech um, machinery designed to transfer 2D plotted edge profiles back into the 3D. Um, the geometry was so complicated that I, I was unfortunately the only one capable of understanding it, so I was physically involved in marking the glass, and then Oscar, as you can see, was sort of scoring it it would go through a series of checks, it would get grind, grind, and then this is the final step, that is the lamination. So it gets bagged into a vacuum, and then go into the autoclave for the final lamination process. The installation itself is uh, quite challenging because all the typical suction cups would not work in this case, so rigging becomes an art form in itself um, because you can easily break the grass just simply lifting it up. As simple as that. The glasses are very, very big. And you need to be a bit of a climber too to clamp the glass when the structure beneath is um, it's a bit uh, un uneven. So those are some photographs of Jeff uh, and his struggles. Um, in progress shots. Um, as I said, glass is a moody material and he doesn't like extremes, at, at least in terms of temperature. So we were spending hours and hours installing one piece of glass we were going home, we were coming back the day after and the glass was broken. So we had to do a, quite a substantial amount of work in trying to understand what were the reason of the breakages. So here, I'm here measuring the temperature of the glass at different times of the day. And as you can see, each color represented a different temperature range. There is a quite a big migration of, 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 of temperature um, on the different parts of the glass. We've done a number of breaking tests so we were wanted to make sure that the nonlinear stress analysis were as per the reality. So we were actually breaking the glass on purpose to understand which was the breaking point as well as studying the pattern of the cracks. There is a whole science be be behind um, what is called a mechanical crack and a thermal crack. So you can potentially uh, define which was the cause of the breakage by looking at the pattern of the stress of, of the cracks, which I think is very fascinating. A lot of laboratory tests to find the optimal grinding level. Um, because the edge of the panels was exposed, um, and because when you score and cut the glass, you generate um, micro cracks, you need to polish it off in order to make it as smooth as possible. But Overgrinding it is as bad as undergrinding it. So we went through a series of extensive tests to find the right balance, the right sand, sand, sandpaper thickness, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, those are some images of uh, surface manipulation. We had cases in which the glass just didn't want to bend um, beyond a certain point. It had the tendency to fold or flip, flip up. So we had to redesign. Uh, the two molds needed to manufacture these two pieces of glass in order to finish the projects. That was quite challenging. So these are some of the snapshots that show you the um, very non-linear process required to finish the job. And uh, this, uh, these are some photographs of the final product. Very powerful design, extremely complex, um, and very, very difficult. Uh, th this is definitely the most complicated double band glass structure in the world. 
At the same time, Frank Gehry was designing an interior application for a restaurant in New York called Condé Nast. He was facing different type of challenges, but uh, glass is just a material that deserves a lot of respect and a lot of patience and a lot of trial and errors. So from one extreme to the other, if uh, the MOS project is a, is a design in which you focus on uh, the characteristics of the materials, um, the um, expression of the design intuitions, the Beijing Airport designed by Foster Partners is a, a, a very precise and highly controlled machine. Um, the office works in a very systematic way. Um, the staff, um, the employees are absolutely the best and um, they can deliver a design of this complexity, which is twice as big as the Hong Kong airport, which was for a number of years the biggest building in the world. This is twice as big. It was designed literally in, in a year and a half. So I will show you some of the techniques that I learned from, from that office and, you know, um, a linear process, the linear process used by Foster and Partners to control such level of complexity. Um, just to give you an idea of scale, um, from terminal T3A to T3B, it's, it's about three kilometers. Um, I'm not sure how many miles it is, but probably two miles. And, um, and uh, the two roofs are very organic in nature. There is zero repetition in the space frame system and the penalization, actually in the space frame system. And the um, complexity is described in a very rational way. So this is what, this is the most important part of the drawing set, it's called geometrical set out. This is the recipe required to achieve, in order to achieve a, a particular type of surface, a surface that then will be used to extract and design all the different components, starting from the space frame system, the column supports, up to the final panels and the roof lights and the skylights. So it is extremely complicated. It is done fully in microstation. Uh, Foster has a number of programmers in-house working full-time writing lines and lines of codes. So they managed to control the building in a very elegant way, I think. Um, as you can see, the space frame has, uh, is a typical um, strut node combination where the top and the bottom cords are varying in depth according to the program, according to the spans. So this is a section cut in this location which you can see the variable depth of the system. Surface, top and bottom, definition of the boundary conditions which are always the most difficult one to control because it's where you have most, the most transition between elements. You go from roof to gutter to soffit panels to cladding and et cetera, et cetera. So those, those need to be very highly, very well controlled, especially because you have different contractors working on each one of them. So if the drawings are not describing the geometry in the most efficient way, you can, it can lead to a lot of problems. It is a sort of partial parametric model. Um, uh, microstation, it's not the most powerful tool, but if used in a wise way, it can really deliver a lot of for you. And this is part of the scale of it. Um, it is a gigantic building. Collaboration with Arabs London, so all the space frame struts were controlled by a script. And I will show you at the end a couple of examples of what you can do with scripting techniques. Relationship between uh, bottom and uh, top and bottom surfaces. So the building was designed and conceptualized in parallel with all the consultants. Cladding consultants, structural engineer, MEP, electrical. So having an accurate 3D model that could be shared by all these people is absolutely crucial, especially when you use technology such as space from system where the tolerances are very, very limited. So here are some images. Every piece of the building was modeled. All these blue lines, you can probably, you can't see them very well. Each one is a strut. Each one has a different lens, different relationship with the other members, different position in space, et cetera, et cetera. We've done a lot of studies on the, um, different components. So you have a space from system that becomes a variable depth well, um, welded truss that supports a gigantic gutter. This is a, one of the exterior columns and this is the, the cladding system. The, the Beijing airport is a sort of evolution of Chep Lacoque. So you have this beautifully elegant roof with huge open spaces um, where natural light is, is one of the main 
design factors and where all the mechanical equipments are actually underground. So it's like a very big um, roof system. So I will go through very quickly. Um, you having an accurate digital model is not enough. You need the different techniques that will help you more or less in a different way according to the different design phases. So big physical model, quick axonometric views in which you model the basic components, different views. Um, you play a lot with the glass sizes because those are usually a compromise or a negotiation factor with whoever's gonna do the fabrication of them. Foster in this case tends to push to the biggest size, which is usually the most expensive, which is usually the one that not as many people can do. So because of the economical, uh, environmental, uh, economical, social, political, economical condition, you need to sort of customize the different components accordingly. Each one has a different impact in terms of shading devices. The glasses are very big, so those are elevation to give you an idea of scale. And those are some drawings used to describe the, the, the geometrical set out for the glass. Some walls are sloping out in the building, some others are vertical. So the definition of the glass profiles very much depend on, on these different relationships. Transoms, uh, this is one of the most important details in the building simply because you as a spectator, you, you would literally stand, stand on it. So uh, the elegance of the details, or at least specific key details, is, is very much controlled. So a lot of uh, quick modeling, just to quickly visualize, focusing on the section, custom section, the different tubes, different connections, different plates, et cetera, et cetera. Then everything gets tested out on a physical model. Um, and. Um, in this particular case, it's not a typical white and grayish Foster's design. It's, it's using uh, sort of complex gradients um, for the coloring of the space frame, the coloring of the roof tiles. Um, obviously, it's a Chinese project, so those are also the national, the national colors. So a little bit of marketing in this case. Some early elevations. Terminal 3B at top, terminal, sorry, T3A top and T3B bottom, completely unique. Um, some test of understanding the scale of the panels. It is an airport, so it will be seen from the sky as much as we will be on the ground. So understanding the, the right scale, it is important. Some uh, presentation material when Norman would sell this idea to the clients. And then options, a lot of options. It's a very systematic design, so you never really take a decision without trying three or four variations. So this was option A and different option B, just flipping the different panels, it would give you a dramatic different effect, as well as the, the quality of the material, the quality of the paint, reflectivity, et cetera, et cetera. So those are some quick views, just to give you an idea. Very basic uh, solar shadings, testing on the physical model. Evolution of the roof lights, as well as implementation of uh, filtered layers <coughs> to emphasize certain aspects of the natural light. Uh, a lot of lighting studies to optimize the position of the roof lights. Every one of these was modeled in 3D accurately by using complex scripts, chosen scheme, night and day, quick studies, and quick animations just to help non-architects to understand the strategy of the color system, color scheme. So you always have an accurate 3D model, accurate to the 0 0.0001 millimeter, and then you distribute it to different people. So the, same, the, ve the very same model can be used by any visualizer to come up with a very simple 3D Studio Max animation. So there's no extra modeling required. And you know, a simple animation like this one can, if it's true that an image is worth a thousand words, um, you know, a 15 second animation, maybe a little bit more. <clears throat> so this is a quick um, description of the color strategy. And this was done very, very early, so it went through a series of iteration and modification and changes, et cetera, et cetera. Edge condition, as I said, is usually the most difficult one because um, it is where you have the most transition between building components. 
And when you have a variable depth space frame, it becomes interesting or important to understand the relation between the top and the bottom surface because you are trying, to, you, your goal is to optimize as much as you can the panels, the panelization system in order to con contain costs. So every little saving will give many more chances of survival for certain design decisions. A lot of design decisions usually die because of the cost factors. So if you have control on the panelization strategy, you have a lot of firepower to push other ideas if you can and want. So those are very early renderings. Um, Soffit panel studies. <coughs> because most of the lighting is within the cavity of the space, the, the, the distance between the soffit panels will give you very, very different perception of the space. So you do a number of studies. You go for the optimal solution, et cetera, et cetera. Um, since I've been very quick, I'm going to show you a couple of other projects we are, which are somewhere in between. They are high-profile designs currently under development. Um, I was hired by the fabricator, actually, to help the architect um, understand a little bit better the complexity of the geometry. So it's, it's, a, it's a project designed by a, a, an Italian architecture office called Mario Bellini, and uh, it's uh, for the new Louvre extension in Paris. It is uh, a very soft uh, roof structure that would cover the courtyard of this new classical building. Those are some of the images of the winning schemes in which we're trying, uh, playing around with materials. So it is a system that has an outer skin, which will be glass with a certain technology, a space frame system in between, and the metal mesh at the bottom. Those are some early AutoCAD drawings. Um, so because my client was the fabricator, you go straight down to the nuts and bolts of it, which are arguably some of, most of the, some of the more, I would say the most important part of the design because um, the elegance of the detail will uh, give quality to the, the ultimate to the design. So as you can see here, you have cast technology for these IG units, and I will show you some images. It's very simple space frame, or relatively simple space frame, and then a metal panel inside the bottom of it to hide the sort of uh, industrial look of the space frame. So this is a, a mock-up. As you can see, the glass is, uses a cast technology. So it is each triangular panel is custom made using certain type of patterns. Those are some of the, mo the, the models studied by the architect. And what I was doing in this particular project is to find a strategy to understand the geometrical variation of the outer, middle layer, and, and bottom skins. Um, because of the cast technology, um, which is very, very expensive, um, the, in order to make the structure more cost effective, you need to find ways and strategies to standardize the panels. So instead of having 6,000 unique panels, which will require 6,000 molds, um, you need to try to find ways of maintaining the elegance and sexiness of the geometry while trying to reduce the complexity, the geometrical complexity. In this particular place, place the patterns, uh, the glass patterns will dictate the patterns of the space frame and the bottom panels because the relation between the geometry, uh, as you can see here, you have a triangular top cord and hexagonal bottom cord. So the size of the glass will tell the size of the metal panels and the bottom one. So um, unfortunately, it's a very, very complicated exercise. So in this particular case, I used a number of techniques to tame, tame the geometry. So at least try to understand the behavior of the geometry, of each panels on the geometry, and trying to find ways to rationalize it. So this is an animation which I'm using um, some of the existing tools that Maya is providing in which I'm starting by modeling a flat roof. You can see the little triangles that are modeled on a panel by panel base, uh, one by one. So one is actually an element. They're all constrained with each other. And then I start applying a series of deformation in which um, the goal is uh, for um, the goal is to try to constrain the geometrical deformation of the panel as much as possible. 
So as you can see, it's, the computer is, is running a lot of calculations trying to compromise the geometrical deformation of each panel. And then you start customizing Maya uh, because Maya, unfortunately, is not really a, a tool designed for architecture, uh, as we all know. Um, so there is a quite a substantial amount of customization at the scripting level required in order to uh, allow the software to, to shoot back meaningful information for you. So here, uh, there are a number of macros as written in such a way that you will get some basic geometrical information. And as you can see, um, it, it is sort of a behavioral um, process because um, um, you, you start to, this is part of the script, you start to identify, identify areas in which you have clusters of panels that have the tendency to be deformed in similar ways. So those are opportunities in we, where you can potentially customize or actually non-customize, modularize the panels in different areas. So instead of having 6,000 unique fan panels, you can have groups of families of panels with similar geometrical characteristics and they will have a gigantic impact on the cost of the final structure. Because the, the amount of work is huge, you need to push the software to the, to the limit. You want the software to do all the calculations for you. Because if you were to do this one by one, it would take you the rest of your life. So as you can see here, it's a sort of close up, which you deform the geometry, all the panels are constrained with each other. You play with different variation of deformation and then you freeze the process and you extract the geometrical data, then, then is, which is then exported into an Excel spreadsheet and you analyze the geometrical variations. And then you strategize with the architect and you define the best possible solution for this particular project. Um, I will show you um, a quick one. Another project in which standardization of the panels was not the challenge. The challenge was how to allow architects, engineers, and cladding consultants to talk to each other and design a, a fairly complex structure. This is, a, a, I've been told, is the biggest equestrian stadium in the world and the most advanced. Um, it is currently under construction, and it was designed by uh, one of the one of the uh, one of the most um, um, one of the oldest, actually, architectural offices in Hong Kong. Um, the geometry is apparently not very complicated. Those are basically two toroidal geometry with a rounded trim cut meeting, uh, having a <coughs> excuse me, tangential relationship. It, so it is apparently not that complicated, but all the conditions generated by this geometry and by this series of inclined walls will make the building quite complicated. So. I was hired to, first of all, clean the geometry and the surfaces. Um, you would be surprised how many variations, geometrical variation, you would get um, by modeling certain surfaces um, by different people using the same software. So when the geometry is as tight as this one, or as, as controllable, you're probably gonna, you, you, you shouldn't really trust the software equation that much. You should, you should write your own and being able to, to ex communicate with the engineer that they, they like Excel spreadsheets anyway much more than physical model. So in this particular case, we model two variations of a similar toroidal geometry. We compare with the engineers. We find out after a few months that we were using two surfaces with a half a meter difference at the edge of it, which is not good. So we find, luckily we found the problem and we start working on the same project again. As you can see, this is the differential of two apparently toroidal geometries. Uh, you agree on that and then you start producing. A lot of calculation of areas for cost estimations, a lot of modeling of all the steel members. So this model was used by the engineer to run his analysis, so we're using exactly the same geometries. And while the engineer runs his own analysis, um, the architect can start focusing on the elegance of these components. So those are people, it's a quite big building. So there's huge concrete buttresses that supports um, these complex curved inclined walls, quite dense truss systems, and quite dense 
transition between the different elements. So we're literally splicing and cutting section after section because that's the most efficient way to understand. In this particular case, the distance between the truss and the wall, because you need to provide to uh, deflection movement, uh, thermal movements, as well as installation, sequencing, spacing required, and cleaning equipment. So those are all done and controlled in 3D. Everything has to go through, and I stress the fact that it has to go through 2D AutoCAD, which is, believe it or not, the standard software used by most of the designers in the world. So whatever you design has to be translatable into a 2D drawing. And then you start uh, playing with the fun part, which are a series of parametric trusses. They would allow you flexibility every time you make some changes and the study, careful studies of the different conditions. So this is the base condition for the truss. Um, variation of studies of the corner condition. When you have a wall that has 20 degrees inclination meeting another one with 12, with a 25 meter, uh, what is it, uh, 75 feet tall truss, which is um, one and a half meter deep, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I lost all my feet and inches calculation, but it, it's a very deep truss meeting at the corner. Uh, clearance issues are very important. So you uh, come up with a less painful solution. You strategize on the standardization of the glass, at which point the panels are not standard anymore. You replace deep trusses with slightly thicker members, and all this is done in, in real time with uh, cladding consultants and structural engineers and then you start working on the details. Uh, this is an interesting detail because since the roof is so uh, unstable due to the geometry and the big cutout in the middle, and um, you want to come up with a system which would kind of isolate the deflection of the roof under a certain environmental condition and the, and the curtain wall. So it is a, what is called a three-pin system, pin connection, pin connection, pin connection. So if the roof, and I'll show you what I mean in a second, if the roof moves, let's say, 300 minors and 100 plus due to certain condition, let me see, oops, sorry. So you, you have to imagine that you're gonna, you have the roof here, this is a big transfer beam, so the roof will wobble up and down that much the three-pin system will allow the wall to follow the movement of the glass. Um, so the, the low transfer from roof to glass is actually minimized, which means you can have much lighter trusses, much wider piece of glass, and I would say much more interesting design. So there's a, some animation that we've done to not only measure using inverse kinematics models the amount of movement that the glass will need to have in order to design the precise flexible joints, but also to see, as you can see here, the roof is also allowed to slide longitudinally. So this is a ball bearing joint. So it is very, buildings move and they move a lot. So thinking in a dynamic way is always very important. Um, aesthetics are also as important. As you can see here, this is an early model in which we try to taper the, the ending of the truss to come up with a more elegant um, transition between steel and concrete. Uh, this is people, just to give you an idea of scale. Um, those are coordination with all the consultants, which we'll use to the AutoCAD, so you need to find ways to coordinate the 2D drawings with your 3D model and vice versa. And then you go uh, into some aesthetical analysis, which sort of start to, it is concrete, so it's a material that you can treat in a more sculptural way. You can play with different variations and you can do the studies in a very quick way. As well as trying to reduce the amount of concrete required by trying to carve out different shapes in order to make it more light, elegant, and et cetera, et cetera. It's, it is a production 3D model. So it, it's a model in which you can snap in any point and you should be able to get accurate information. So as you can see here, we are locking down the transition between steel truss and concrete. So in case you have a steel contractor and a concrete contractor, two independent people, at least they know where they have to meet, end up meeting at the end of the day. 
which is always very debatable. And also you do a series of what is called clash tests to make sure that the different geome geometries are not clashing with each other. And then you can always take snapshots, very quick snapshots to really understand the geometry. Very quickly, um, relationship between building and grid is usually very intimate as well as the um, relation between the supports. Optimization of the angles. The engineer will do a number of <coughs> excuse me, analysis for you. One or two degrees in certain geometry will make a quite a big difference. In this case, we were trying to reduce the deflection of this outer truss. So the, the model is very, very crude, uh, but it is good enough to get very important valuable numbers. And those are some snapshots. As well as negotiation between how much tapering for the bottom cord of the truss you can have. The engineers don't want to give, don't want to give you any tapering. The architect wants a lot of tapering, um, as always. So it is important to sit down and talk about and negotiate with that. So I don't know how much time I have, but um, what I would like to do is to show you a couple of things. Um, show you what you can do with even the software like Maya, which is quite sophisticated. And then we can always go back and show you some other projects, which uh, I would be interested in showing you as well. So if this is the project that I just showed you, um, the construction industry is uh, speeding up at an incredible rate. It means that the clients are giving you less and less time. The geometries are getting more and more complicated. So you need to find ways to reduce or increase the efficiency of your production techniques. And even a software like Maya is very, very powerful because it allows you to do a crunch a lot of calculation very quickly. So as you can see here, we have a, our roof that will give me the boundary of the upper portion of the glass. Um, we have a um, inclined and sloping glass wall which changes in height, which has condition transition between concrete elements, entrances. And we want to transform this into a truss system that can be analyzed by an engineer. So with a little bit of scripting experience, a little bit of trigonometry, and a little bit of math, you can generate very quickly um, very interesting structural system by writing a code. In this particular case, this is all customized Maya. We can build. I need to put the numbers. Uh, you can write a code in which you choose what is a variable, what is a constant. Uh, you deal with different building conditions. Um, in this case, I want to have 1.6 meter high um, uh, glass module. The wall is 28 degrees inclination in this particular case. I press the soft the, the button, and the, I don't know if you can see it. Maya is building trust by trust automatically. So in less than 10 seconds, we have modeled quite a big number of trusses, which vary in height, depth. The position of the cords are changing because the wall is, is inclined. As you can see, there is a little bug here, but uh, most of it seems to work fine. Uh, the code is capable to understanding what is time to step down. So you can say, if the glass is smaller than a certain dimension, I want you to jump to the next module. This, the very same file will be used, it can be used by the engineer, uh, because it's built component by component. So while the engineer runs this analysis, we can visualize them using rectangular or circular sections, as well as applying a little bit of parametric logic into it in which we can actually customize either as a, as a complete wall in this case or two by two with the actual dimensions. So you can also visualize it at the same time. Um, so this is one way of, of, of speeding up the process because softwares like MicroStatio and Maya are not really fully parametric. So if any of those components change, all the others will have to change. So you need to find ways to regenerate geometry very, very quickly. So I'll show you how you can do 
Um, just going back to the Beijing Airport project. second this is no good I don't know why it's happening when you have a three kilometers long roof where each single line in space is unique physical model manual model doesn't really take you very far because there is way too many components excuse me Try start again. So um, <clears throat> you kind of have to um, use different techniques to generate your structural systems, and you can use the same techniques by using the most primitive so software. Is actually Excel as well. Um, at the end of the day, the, an engineer will require uh, a line in space, and um, What you need to do with the tool is, is define relationship between components by using some built-in All right. So this is an example of what it could be a long span roof structure. So Maya allows us to have fun at this stage by dealing with a sort of partially parametric nonlinear manipulation. So you can study very quickly very, very different geometries. <coughs> As you can see here, I defined relation between a top chord and a potential bottom chord. Right now they're a simple offset, but they don't need to be. Once you're kind of happy with the geometry and you need to start extracting meaningful data, um, you can write a quick script that would generate component by component for you. So in this particular case, I wrote a script that would generate a space room system with a particular configuration. As you can see here, I am literally knitting a surface. In this case, is a, is a NURB surface of third degree. And the software is calculating very quickly all the different struts. Let me just visualize them for you. So it is built component by component. And as I said before, you can send this to any structural engineer and you can start understanding the actual performance of the systems. Or if you want to, you can use some plugins that are coming out now that you can use to get your personal feedback um, in terms of structural performance. But the beauty of scripting is that once the bulk of the code is written, you can start studying variations of certain systems in a very, very quick way. Um, and you would be surprised how elegant variation of structural system will, or how much elegant certain system will have according to certain geometries. So here the software is sort of visualizing every line into a tube, something the engineer doesn't really care, but us as architect, we do. Um, but once that is done, let me open the same file we can potentially study variation of systems. So that was um, a rectangular top chord with the rectangular bottom offset its system. But you can as easily customize it into a diagonal top and bottom triangular penalization. So this is how quick my actually compute this number for you. It's quicker than other software. And because it's all done at the, at the core level, the numbers are actually accurate as long as the surface that you're using is accurate, of course. So this is, those are some tricks that you can use in order to dramatically shorten the design time and at the same time start communicating and exchanging ideas with, uh, in this case, structural engineer 
and potentially cladding consultant. This is one example of a space room system. And I will show you one final example. I don't want to bore you anymore. Um, I think this is important because usually the relationship between structure and panelization, um, it's the most important, the most difficult, the most critical part of the design. So understanding how the building looks like, what the, what, what the building looks like is very important. So um, you can write a similar code that would generate panel system for you. As you can see here very quickly, we have uh, one type of panelization to give you one visual impact. You can modif slightly modify that and come up with another configurations. So you can get into all sorts of interesting fractal relationships, so you can play with scales, relation with elements, and et cetera. So you can go on and on. And because most of the code is there, you just need to shuffle around a couple of variables and you can really explore a high number of variations. So let's say we want to go for a panelization system which is composed by triangular panels so we don't have to worry about warped or bent panels. You can start defining open areas, closed areas. Um, the surface mesh is irrelevant when you get into the code level. And then you can start giving certain level of intelligence. In this case, I want to break all the panels into families according to their orientation in space, for example. Or it can be in terms of their materiality. And uh, since Maya is a good visualization tool, it allows you to build up a library per panel. So each panel becomes an individual. And what you do, you try to understand the relationship between each other. Um, so you can do a lot of things as well as, and this is the last thing I'm going to show you for tonight. Um, finding ways to communicate with uh, cost estimators, for example, or you want to build your physical model accurately. So we, what you can do, you can flatten all the panels on a level, so now you can literally print it out of your printer, one by one. They're already organized in families. You can organize them, so you know how many panels you have per family according to whatever logic you decided to place into the, into the script. And then the ultimate, the most boring thing, which is how big are these panels? So even Maya can actually name them, dimension them, and you can export everything into an Excel spreadsheet, as well as defining automatically where certain panels will need to be in space by extracting XYZ coordinates. So those are some of the examples, some of the tricks required, especially when you work on projects which are very, very complicated where there is almost no variation, no uh, repetition, and et cetera, et cetera. So I just want to conclude with a quick slideshow of, of some of the projects in which I'm very fortunate to be involved in, um, which are very different with each other, which are dealing with very different social cultural conditions, and which are all very complex in 3D. Those are 52 of these stations, every one or most of them different with each other in the Middle East. Towers in Hong Kong, gigantic stadiums, Middle East, complex towers. Twisted surfaces are becoming the most difficult surfaces to control, especially when you design either residential building or office buildings where the budgets for the cladding is usually very low. So the digital techniques will help you a lot in understanding the level of complexity and potentially tone it down, uh, building that I showed you before. Residential towers, very aggressive designs in the Middle East. Middle East is a very, very powerful market. Uh, Shanghai, Bahrain, City Hall. Restaurants, even smaller scale designs can be extremely complicated. This is a restaurant in Hong Kong with very, very unique staircases. <coughs> Public buildings, Middle East. Shopping malls. Uh, I know that you don't like shopping malls very much, but um, they are becoming the contemporary cathedral. A lot of money is invested, very complex geometries, very sculptural places. 
sorry? For this one? All, this particular one? There are, most of them are uh, Hong Kong architects, actually. Um, I can give you the names. Would you be interested in knowing the names? Yeah. All right, let me start from the beginning. AIDAS, which is a commercial office which has branches all over the world. Lee and Orange is an Hong Kong firm. And by the way, the, all these offices have a range that goes from 150 to 600 employees. So they're all very unknown, or at least they were when I was a student at your age. But they're all pushing the boundaries very, very hard. And they're very, very busy. And they are, lucky for me, they're looking for people with certain specialized skills because the geometry is very complicated. Um, Lean Orange, AIDAS. Keep in mind, this is the amount of work that I've done in two and a half years. And um, the, because the time required, the time given by the client in, in, in these projects in Asia is very, very short. So in, in a six months time, you need to produce as much as you would you know, in Italy it would take 10 years, for example. Um, in England, maybe a year, in the US, probably a year. So everything is very much compressed. So the architect usually comes up with the basic concept, then he hires specialized consultants very, very early in the design phase. And then it's a constant work and polishing and grinding and modifying. So having advanced digital techniques is very, very important. Um, this is a Canadian architect, actually. Um, that was fired, unfortunately. I don't remember his name, and he was hired. Then they hired the cladding consultant to finish it off. A lot of strange things are happening in China. Um, this is Leon Orange again, which is one of my best clients. Uh, Leon Orange, Leon Orange, PNT, another big Hong Kong office. Um, Jerdy, this is actually Jerdy here in uh, uh, my, um, Venice Beach. Um, Jerdy for the podium. This is a gigantic um, um, casino in Macau where you have Jerdy with the podium, Architectonica for the towers. A, um, a, there is an auditorium in the back that will, done, will be done by Pei Sun. Um, I don't remember his name. And a lot of complexity, a lot of studies in spatial perception within the envelopes. So this is a, a gigantic. Uh, three-dimensional screen where you, we could have three-dimensional projections. It would be a very, very expensive structure with a lot of double band, custom cut metal panels, perforated metal panels, um, big spaces with aquariums, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah, that's it. So if you have any questions, I would be very happy to answer. Um, I can show you more projects, um, more or less interesting. Uh, but um, I'm finished. If you have time, I can show you more more projects. I don't know. What do you think? Would you like to see more? If, you, if anybody has any specific questions, we also have, uh, following this for our class, the 2GB, we need to look through your projects quickly. So we have like 10 more minutes for Roberto to answer the questions and then unfortunately we need to move on because we really have a tight schedule. <laughs> so please, uh, I, I saw somebody raising her hand for, with a question. Yuki, you had a question? And Neil? Give me two. I'm sorry? Well, what we will try to do is to, <sighs> well, you see, is try to understand how complex things are in reality. Um, it's very, very easy to push and pull CVs in space with the software that we use. But the translation process, analytical process, rationalization process required to make it buildable is really, really tough. So it's just a week. And hopefully in that week, I'll be able to, we will be able to go through a series of basic steps that hopefully will scare you enough 
So next time they design a complex geometry, you will, you'll be a little more careful about certain things. Um, architect, yeah. Well, at this time, I think the, it, because the project is being studied from different points of view, each team has a different project they studied from different points of view, it would be interesting at this stage to take their, their design, step back, do a few analytical studies to see what is the performance of the systems, mainly in terms of geometry, and see what is the impact um, on the, from the local scale to the global scale of the building. So. Their own studio project, yes. So it's um, an extra layer of analytical work on top of what they're already doing. It's crazy right now. The problem is that um, <clears throat> the Asian market puts a lot of value on branding. So what happens usually, they hire a star architect to come up with the concept. Uh, usually they buy you know, a little bit of um, a DD stage, and then they hire a local architect to actually make it happen. So what happens in Hong Kong, you have these uh, 15 architects, architecture offices that have a huge manpower. You have offices literally with five, 600 people. And uh, because the market is so hungry of new design and new ideas, these offices that nobody ever heard of, unless you are working in a particular city, uh, have now the opportunity to design crazy things. And the market uh, is literally giving them a free range. I mean, what happened in China, Macau, Middle East, Southeast Asia in general is absolutely out of control. So, well, before you, you have the usual suspects, British and Americans, KPF, SOM, um, uh, for the Hong Kong market, Cesar Pelli, sort of uh, sophisticated commercial architects. Um, I think that uh, Frank Gehry is starting now to build something in, in, in Singapore. Because the problem is that the, the, the Asian market wants a, a building that gives you the wow effect, but it's, they're not willing to pay for it. So there is a lot of uh, compromises and negotiations. Um, so the star architects, you know, Zaha did, a lot of people are, are working in the Middle East. Um, but they need to rely on local architects to actually put it together. So they, they sort of find this partnership with these uh, offices. Hong Kong is very well connected because it's been a British colony. and. Uh, they sort of have this sort of triangle between London, Hong Kong, and, uh, and the Middle East, and they're all working like crazy. I mean, they're all very, very busy. It's just the uh, nature of the market right now, I guess. Um, and each one has a different pros and cons. Yes. I'm actually using uh, their tool to design most of these buildings because it's the tool that has enough power to control these crazy schedules and these crazy complexities and geometries. Because when the time of production is so compressed, the most important part is communicating with all the different consultants. So you need to be able to modify your model almost in real time because you need to feed everybody. Because the, the type of process required to design this building is very difficult, different from the traditional one. When the architect, more or less sophisticated, comes up with a concept, it puts together a bunch of drawings that are all wrong, and then it dumps it to the contractors and all consultants. Uh, because the time is so limited, and because everybody is in the same boat, the numbers have to be right. So having an accurate 3D model as a pivot, it's becoming more and more important. Because all the drawings, all the 2D drawings, will be coming out from the softwares. So it, it is becoming more and more like a product design in a way, designing a car, so you build all the components. And the models that I do are used by uh, the designers at the top of the food chain, which is the architect or the consultants that the architect hires, as well as the fabricator. I have a project in which I'm providing the cut profiles of each panel. Uh, when you have 6,000 panels that are all unique, um, there is only one way of doing it, building an accurate 3D model. Otherwise, 
even if the panels are co manufactured correctly, if all the components around are wrong, you won't be able to put it together. So there is a little bit of shuffling of responsibilities, so the contractual structure is quite different now. And um, you just have to keep up with the pace, <laughs> which is really nasty, really, really nasty. But very exciting, I mean, all these buildings are very challenging. You might not like them from the conceptual, theoretical point of view, but if you sort of peel off that the surface, 